Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to SCNA Conversations. My name is Lauren Shea Warner, and I am the Membership Engagement and Stewardship Coordinator. Today's program features Kate Smith, Class of 94, Conservator of Paintings and the Head of the Paintings Lab at the Harvard Art Museum, and Danielle Carabino, Curator of Painting and Sculpture. Next slide, please. Before I hand this over to our panelists, a few housekeeping items. We encourage you to type in the Q&A box throughout the presentation or in the Facebook Live post. Danielle and Kate will be following along and look forward to answering any questions you may have. I will now turn it over to Danielle. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I just wanted to briefly introduce uh, our, our guest, Kate Smith. Uh, as Lauren said, she's class of 94. And I have a brief biography. Um, Kate Smith is conservator of paintings and head of the paintings lab at the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies at the Harvard Art Museums. Uh, she received her master's in conservation in 2001 from Buffalo State College. And she went on to work as assistant conservator at the Harvard Art Museums, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, Gianfranco, Gianfranco Pocobene Studio, and the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. She rejoined the staff of the Strauss Center as an associate conservator in 2012. Kate studies and preserves the Harvard Art Museum's paintings collection from ancient Roman fresco fragments to 20th century oil paintings. She specializes in the technical examination of paintings using radiography, infrared reflectography and luminescence imaging to investigate artist materials and techniques. With her Strauss Center colleagues, she lectures for two history of art and architecture courses, the making of art and artifacts, history, material and technique and science and the practice of art, as well as for the Summer Institute for the Technical Study of Art. And I'll just say it was my privilege to work with Kate uh, at the Harvard Art Museums for uh, many years, actually, and uh, I learned so much from her um, and am really delighted that she has been able to join us today just um, to kind of talk about her, her work with us. Uh, just a few words about how that came about. Um, obviously, Kate and I know each other, and she was at our museum um, looking at uh, some paintings together with me, and um, eventually I contacted her with a question about our mummy portrait, which is uh, the protagonist really of our, of our talk today. And it just so happened that she was entrenched at the time in a project to investigate Harvard's uh, mummy portraits. And so um, we decided that we would uh, collaborate, which was very exciting for both of us. Um, Kate was very generous and kind to take our mummy portrait um, and uh, do some examination and cleaning, which she'll talk about today, um, as part of a larger project uh, known as a peer. And again, um, she'll talk a little bit more about this, but it was a um, initiative started at the Getty in 2013 that in, involves some 40 uh, institutions around the world um, that all work on the uh, conservation of mummy portraits, um, of which there are about a thousand in the world, and um, conservators share their findings in a database. And so um, we're really thrilled that we would uh, be able to participate um, in this project. Um, as most of you know, the uh, Smith College Museum of Art does not have its own conservation lab. So this was really such a great opportunity. So what we'll be hearing about today is um, uh, Kate's investigation of both the Harvard mummy portraits and ours, um, and a little bit about her work um, in terms of the um, techniques and materials, um, but also the uh, instruments that she uses. And so we really welcome um, a conversation and any questions you might have about this fascinating um, part of, of uh, the art world. Um, just before I hand it over to her though, I did want to say a few words about mummy portraits in case some people don't know as much about them. Um, mummy portraits, as I said, there are about a thousand in the world. They started to be excavated um, in the Fayum ba uh, Basin, which is um, about 150 miles south of Alexandria in, in Egypt. Um, and they're from the moment in Egypt that um, when uh, it was part of the Roman Empire. So um, they're both kind of Egyptian and Roman, and there's a kind of hybridity that we can talk about there. Um, so they're um, mostly from about the first to the second century uh, um, of, in the Christian era, so um, uh, about 100 to 200. 
And they uh, were first excavated in the late 19th century by an English uh, archaeologist, uh, W.M. Flinders Petrie, and he found about 50, and that kind of set off um, the investigation of others throughout the course of time. Um, I think uh, what's fascinating, we'll see an image of this in just a moment, but they were actually uh, affixed to the mummy itself, and so they were kind of right over the, the face um, and have this very almost kind of eerie lifelike quality to them. They're extremely realistic um, in the way that they're painted um, and really provide kind of a window into the ancient world. Um, I will say it's a, a slice of the ancient world because they're mostly of the wealthy. Um, but we can tell a lot about just the, the portraits um, uh, of, you know, we can tell a lot about the people in terms of who they uh, were and what they might have been um, kind of um, uh, in terms of their social status, uh, their fine clothes, clothing and jewelry, um, their fashionable hairstyles are all also ways that uh, we've been able to date these portraits. So um, there are also a few uh, elements of uh, the works. And in particular, we'll talk about the one at the Harvard Art Museum as well as, well as the um, ones that um, are the one in our collection um, that indicate a kind of uh, re repetition of style. So um, there might be a sense of a workshop or a kind of artistic hand there at play. And we're, we're still very much learning about them, but it's fascinating to note some of these details. Um, and I think uh, without further ado, I think we should just start to uh, learn more about them through Kate. And Kate, I will pass it over to you to start Great. your presentation. Thank you, Danielle. So I'm gonna show you right away an image of the painting we're talking about. This is the Smith College example. She's so beautiful. And I think as Danielle already beautifully summarized, um, this portrait is um, it's from a period when Egypt was part, it was a Roman province. And um, those with the resources to be mummified with elegant portraits like these formed an elite Egyptian class of Greek descent, actually. So the hybridity gets even more complicated because they're, they're often of Greek descent living under the Roman Empire in Egypt, um, painted in a Greek tradition, um, but very much Egyptian in, in their function. And the next image I'm gonna show you says, tells you more about what I mean by that. So what they're literally, as Danielle said, pointed out affixed um, the original context of portraits like these is this intimate association with the mummified body of the, they're a portrait of the deceased person and the, the portrait is placed over the face in place of you know as to serve as the face and although few have remained with the body itself um, the, the entire funerary equipment is usually dismembered and dismantled ex after excavation for sale sadly this was a rampant practice um, for for centuries so seen in the complete original context, it's easier to understand the intersectional nature of those that are depicted. They're truly at once Greek, Roman, and Egyptian, which is just a really fascinating thing to think about these ancient people and their sort of multivariant uh, sort of identities. Um, so the Harvard Art Museums where I work has five examples of this kind of portrait. And you can see three as they're always, three of the most intact are always on view here in the gallery. And like most of these portraits in the modern Western museum collections, the portraits have been separated from their bodies long before being acquired. Um, they're displayed without that context, oriented upright on the wall like any modern portrait. And many visitors don't know the source of these paintings and have no idea just by looking at them that they are in fact a tiny fragment of a complex funerary. Um, and as Danielle pointed out, only about you know, 900 or 1,000 or known examples of this kind of portraiture survive. Most of these are held outside of Egypt, um, the result of unethical 19th century excavation by American, British, German, and other nationalities of archaeologists, um, and of course, grave robbers as well. Um, the inappropriate means by which they were excavated and often dismantled for sale means that virtually all are without archaeological context. Um, so little is actually known about where, how, and why the portraits were made. Um, there's no workshops or studios that have been discovered for us to learn more about the artists or their materials or their practice. So everything we know about these portraits, we've had to glean from their material um, it, itself. And that's really what I'm here to talk to you a little bit about today. And also um, a question that we're currently grappling with as are many museums all over the world is how, how do we respectfully display these memorial objects and encourage visitors to engage with them and with the memories of the people they depict. These are not simply depictions of people, they were created as memorial um, objects for the afterlife. So it's something to always hold in your mind as you're looking at them. 
I wanted to show, and Danielle, feel free to jump in. This is, this is the current display of the Smith example in the special exhibition that you have going on. Anything you want to say about that at the moment? Sure, I just wanted to say that um, as Kate pointed out at the Harvard Art Museums, um, the display is, you know, it's very much a modern display um, as is ours. So in our current installation in SCMA, then now next, which is our uh, centennial exhibition currently on view until December, um, the mummy portrait as you see is on the left and it's part of a group of uh, images of women. And so we thought it would be an interesting thing to think about um, over the course of time through various cultures and geographic areas as how women have been portrayed. And really this is um, the earliest one in, in our collection. Um, and you can kind of see some, some uh, similarities, um, but obviously other differences ac across time about um, uh, concerning how women are displayed. And I will say um, this portrait will go back into the ancient gallery once the exhibition is over. So it'll look a lot more like the, the Harvard Art Museum's installation. Um, so I'll let you continue. Thank you. Thank you. So a bit about the APPEAR project, it stands for the, um, Ancient Panel Painting Examination and Research Project. And so, um, and Danielle summarized it perfectly, so I won't dwell too long here, but essentially all, many institutions, 40 and a growing number, are contributing all the technical, scientific, um, and conservation information they've gathered about their various portraits, all into a single shareable, which will ultimately be, um, it isn't yet, because it's not complete, but a, a public database for research purposes. The idea being that these things are already so fragmentary, that every little bit and so much it, there's so, there's so much more to know about them in um, in congregate. So if we can um, gather as much information and see larger patterns about pigments that were used, the the preparation of the wood panels, the type of binders, the combinations of pigments, um, how they were treated, how they've lived their lives, larger patterns can emerge that can tell us more about them as a group and as a technique. So that's what we're we're contributing to now, and that's what really uh, sparked all of this. Um, intensive research over the last four or five years. Oops, here we go. So the Smith painting is actually very similar to one of the Harvard examples, and I have them both up here. Um, both are women, obviously. They have similar hairstyles and earrings, which date them to about the same period, around the year 200. Um, both wear the clavi, the, the, um, the bands over their shoulders. And um, the, that decorative stripe it signifies sort of a, um, at least with the white tunic, a senatorial rank um, in, in Roman fashion. So it was used to mark Roman allegiance here because you know, neither one woman would have been a senator or a scholar, particularly herself likely, but the, 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 they're chosen to be depicted in this way to mark their Roman allegiance. Um, so both are painted in tempera, which is a paint made of pigments mixed with animal glue as the binder. And this makes a matte finish. It dries very quickly. It doesn't allow for a lot of um, blending or layering, which is why the paint is built up with these sort of hatched lines that you see. The volume is established with, with a, in a linear way and um, sort of bands of color. It gives a graphic linear quality. Um, even the way the features are described is similar. So I draw your attention to the wide eyes that are not symmetrically drawn, the long elegant line of the nose, the way the lips are formed with that dark center curving line and the squared off lower lip, sort of commas at the corners of the mouth, and the slope of the shoulders, the geometry of the neckline and the shape of the face. All of this is very, very similar. Um, so similar, in fact, that my curatorial colleagues and I began to get excited thinking that the Smith portrait may in fact be related in some way to our own. I mean, the similarities were that strong. Um, could it be from the same artist or workshop? Um, so we set about trying to, find an answer to those questions. And that was kind of where this study began. So if you start to look below the surface, the two portraits start to veer away from each other in pretty significant ways um, pretty quickly, beginning with the shape of the wooden panel support. So um, something to know about this type of painting is that various cities or regions produce mummy portraits in characteristic shapes, having to do with the way they'd be inserted into the wrappings. It's just there were different techniques and, and um, traditions. So the Smith example with those angled top corners is typical of finds from a particular archaeological excavation site called Hawara. And while at first glance the Harvard example appears to be simply rectangular, the x-radiographic evidence says otherwise. I'll show you a bit of that now. So I'm showing you on the right of each portrait the radiograph of itself. Um, any technical investigation of paintings often it begins with a non-destructive meaning 
images or analysis that can be performed without taking a sample or altering the object in any way. And so much can be learned from close looking simply with the naked eye um, or through a microscope or with imaging techniques like this. And so we generally x-ray paintings to learn about the internal structure, much like x-raying the body. And for paintings, rather than looking at dense white bones and less dense gray muscles and flesh, we can see the wood grain, um, get a sense of the density of the pigments present or changes that have taken place over time. So you can see things like knots in the wood and the way the wood grain moves around those knots, that kind of thing. And in this case, um, on the Harvard example on the right, metal brads or nails were used to attach wood to the original tapered shape of the panel to create a rectangle. And this would likely have made um, what was a very site-specific memorial fragment more like an intact modern portrait, easier to sell um, and to fold into 19th or 20th century collections. Um, we don't know that that's why it was done, but we're assuming that that's the case. Um, that tapered shape, so far as we can tell, is not yet associated with a particular region, but it can be found on many examples of portrait. It can be related to other, ty other types. Um, so the radiograph tells us something about the pigments that are present also. X-rays are blocked by dense material and those appear lighter on the image. Um, and most of these, most of the portraits seems to disappear when you radiograph it. You can see sort of a ghostly image of certain lines around the eyes maybe or the edge of the form. And so the, um, the pigments that are used in glue tempera paint are very, tend to be very light, uh, chemically light mineral pigments um, like chalk or iron ochres or uh, carbon black. So the one exception here is the upper lip of the Harvard portrait, which you can sort of make out um, and to keep that upper lip in mind, we'll come back to it, but there's a reason why you can see that and everything else sort of disappears in this radiographic image. Go ahead here. So if you can compare the Smith portrait now to another Harvard example that used beeswax, not animal glue as the binder, you'll see a very different appearance in the radiograph. And that's because beeswax, it's either beeswax or animal glue is the typical binders use. Artists chose one or the other. We don't even know if a studio would be dedicated to one type of paint or if they would use both. We still don't know why the two were options. But beeswax saturates pigments very differently than glue. And the chalk used in the Smith portrait to make light colors like gray or the light pink or the flesh tone. The chalk um, to achieve an opaque light color with beeswax the artist would have needed to use lead white, which is much denser, and would also then block the x-rays and show up in the radiograph. So that's why you can make out all these brush, brush strokes and all this sort of texture in the radiograph and the image on the right. It tells us that there's a distinction in pigment type here without even having to take a sample. There's a lot we can learn. So another type of image I wanted to talk to briefly, and I'm gonna sort of race through a lot of um, fairly complicated analytical images, and I'm happy to hop back later, but I just wanna sort of touch on a few high points, the kinds of things we can discover so that we can get to a conversational mode and sort of hash it through together. Um, but these are ultraviolet induced visible fluorescence images, meaning we shine an ultraviolet light source onto the images and then capture the normal light fluorescence that emits from the object. And so, what that's doing is that um, it, uh, there's characteristic ways, characteristic colors that certain pigments will fluoresce. And so you can see it's a diagnostic technique. So um, when UV light, uh, let's see, how, how do I get into this? The, the several types of information can be recorded in this way. So I'm gonna draw your attention to areas that don't correspond to the design. Um, the Smith portrait has dark blotches all over the surface that um, you can see a little thumbnail in the upper left to show you the comparison. So you shine a UV light on it, and this is what it looks like. It looks sort of strange and blotchy. And all of that is um, uh, restoration paint that's much more recent, uses different materials, and they absorb the UV light and don't re it. And the other thing to know about, um, and that's true of the Harvard example as well, but on the Harvard example, the dark absorbent restoration sort of follows the right edge where the new wood was attached. But the wood on the left side has this bright lemony green sort of fluorescence going on here. And that is characteristic of a modern pigment called zinc white. So zinc white was used to create the gray paint that was masking the addition here. And a completely different kind of paint was used to create the gray on the right side. Again, we don't know why. Was there more than one restoration happening at different points? The artist chose different materials. We're just really not sure. So restoration can be detected with 
detected with ultraviolet, which tells us a bit more about the condition. But also um, something called, there's a pigment called Matter Lake, which is a uh, really beautiful deep crimson red, an organic pigment um, that was used to create, um, as you can see in this case, the clavia of the Harvard example, and part of the tunic of the Smith example, as well as hatched lines all through their faces to create the pink um, tones of the skin. And so the way that that fluoresces, we can identify, we know that Matter Lake was used in both examples in this case. What's interesting here is that, so this pink, the Matter Lake would have contributed to the pink color of this tunic, but there was more going on there as well. So here's one little fragment of information. We have to combine it with others. Now we know about the lead white or the chalk. Now we know a bit more about Matter Lake, um, but what more can we discover uh, with different techniques? There's a fairly recent development in this type of imaging, which is called visible induced luminescence imaging, very similar to the UV technique, but you shine normal daylight on a painting and record it in the infrared wavelength with a specially modified camera. In this case with ancient palettes, there were very few um, natural blue pigments available. Certain ones are known to react to these conditions in such a way that you can record and potentially diagnose the presence of indigo. So what I'm showing you in the middle is this, um, um, this is actually a multi-band reflectance subtraction image, which is a whole different thing. And I can explain more about that if you're interested. But essentially what it's telling us here is that everywhere that the black and white images lights up white or positive means that where it's strongest in the signal, that indigo is present. Now we also know from the UV image on the right that matter is present in those same areas. You can see where it follows the tunic most strongly. What that's telling us is that indigo, dark blue, and matter lake, a, brilliant, a deep crimson red, were mixed together to create a purplish tone in the tunic. So now we not only know what pigments are present, but we can see how they were mixed and all of this without needing to take um, samples, which is incredibly rich information. We also, I'm a conservator. So my, my profession has to do with um, examining paintings, understanding how they're made, restoring them when damaged, um, but, and doing the kind of technical imaging that I've described today. But my, I have conservation science colleagues at the Strauss Center who are pure scientists, chemists, and physicists who do materials analysis, who I work very closely together with, but the instrumentation that I'm not trained to use it or understand it. These are, these are um, I'm sort of uh, science adjacent. I know how to converse, but I don't know how to, how, to, how to practice. So my science colleagues then take this type of imaging a step further by doing deeper, probes with, this is an x-ray fluorescence unit that can identify individual elements that are present at different points on the, on the image where we can start to drill down a little deeper and be a little more positive about the pigments that are part of, this, part of these portraits. And also, let's see what my next image is here. They also um, often take tiny, tiny samples the size of a head of a pin. You're able to mount them in resin and polish them from one side to see, them, to see the paint um, strata in cross section. So that way we can look at both the thickness and order, the thickness and sequence of paint layers as they were applied, and then apply the same instrumentation to identify the pigments particle by particle, layer by layer. So we're really able to get an incredible amount of information from these tiny little, tiny little chips and apply many of the same techniques we use to the portrait overall. So for in this example, these tiny samples were taken. Here's a detail of where it was taken from. So from the edge of her tunic, this tiny area here at the edge of a, an indigo stripe over a mixed pink piece of the tunic. Here is what we call the ground layer. It's a priming layer that would have been applied to the wood. And then this very thin layer of pink, which is the tunic, which is the mixture of matter lake and indigo. And in this case, you can see the matter pigment fluoresces in ultraviolet light, whether you're looking at the overall painting or a tiny section of an a microscopic it behaves the same way. So the individual pigment particles are here fluorescing. And this tiny little thin area here is a dark stroke of pure indigo, which was used to create the, the small lines and folds of the garment. Same kind of activity going on over here. The priming layer is here, but in this case, it's simply white pigment. There's no black or yellow, anything mixed in. And the, um, the paint layers that were applied much more thickly, again, using matter as we already had identified, but the application process is very different. The priming, the color of the priming, one is applied on a gray ground, one is applied on a white ground. These are more distinctions that um, seem very, very subtle, but are the kind of changes that imply different artists are at work here. 
So despite the fact that the two portraits resemble each other so closely, the nuts and bolts of fabrication are different enough to um, suggest that they were made by different people. So this is the Smith portrait again. She was just such a pleasure to work with. And there's something so immediate about these portraits that um, it's not hard to remember to maintain a reverential attitude when standing in front of them, picking them up and carrying them, working on them in this way. That, as I mentioned earlier on, in the absence of archaeological context for these objects, we're very, very interested in providing them with whatever material context we can, given the tools and resources that we have, in order to find ways to honor their memory um, now that they've been dishonored in this way for so many centuries. They're just remarkable, remarkable artifacts to work with. So I welcome any and all questions. And I can, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now, but I'm happy to reshare um, uh, if that becomes useful or necessary. And um, if I can figure out how to do that, let me go there. Um, yes, so that is where we're at. Okay, so I'll just jump back in here so we can have a bit of a conversation. And I see we have some questions, so we can get to those in just a moment. But um, before we do, um, I just I wanted to maybe raise the question of the ethics of con conservation, um, because you mentioned previous conservations, and there was a question about kind of how you can tell, um, you know, where previous restorations have been made and, and kind of what time, um, at what point in time. Um, and something I learned actually from you and, and uh, the colleagues at the Harvard Art Museums is how different conservation is today than it was in the 19th century. And so maybe if you can just touch on that um, with the examples that you showed us, that would be helpful. Sure. I think what's been happening since, maybe since the 1920s, but more, but really seriously since the 1970s when the um, graduate training programs for conservation were developed, um, is the field has really professionalized and grown from strictly a craft um, skill set to um, um, one grounded in um, scholarship, in historical context, in collaborative research with um, inter interdisciplinary collaboration. So that since the 70s, but in some ways earlier, what we've begun to embrace, very much begun, and, and absolutely the, our code of ethics um, um, guides us to all of our interventions are to the best of our ability meant to be reversible, to use stable materials that will last a long time and be easily reversed if um, new information or new understanding um, emerges that would make us um, rethink the way we'd approached a treatment or an analysis. So the modern conservation is very interested in um, original artist intent, in transparency of our own work, um, documenting it carefully so that it's very clear. Um, if we do perform an intervention or a restoration, it's, it's, you're able to easily determine where that work is taking place and what's original. So the, the ethics has really built up over the last I don't know, 50, 75 years to establish that um, we're, what we're doing is not to be hidden. And it's, it's always done with the intention of, of increasing legibility of whatever work we're working on. So I hope that starts to answer the question. We, we try to be as aware as, of, as we can that we're always products of our own time. My understanding of this painting now is not the same as someone in the 19th century, and it won't be the same as someone in the 22nd century. You know, so we have to be aware of that and try to um, keep what we do uh, reversible and understandable. Yeah, thank you. So um, just to kind of um, end that question from one of our listeners, um, they were curious about if you can actually date the restorations based on the evidence that you've been able to see. Sometimes. I mean, we don't have, unfortunately, all of the restorations on um, the Smith and the Harvard examples were done before they entered our collections. So we don't have actual documentation of what happened. Okay. But in the case of the, of the Harvard example, so the zinc, the zinc pigment used in the restoration, there's a date, I don't know, zinc white. I think it's a late 19th century pigment. It might have been known as early as the 1820s. That's something I'd have to go back and check. It's certainly a pigment that's been around a while, but not, not earlier than the 19th century. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I mean, a lot of pigments, um, all the pigments that are used in these portraits from the year 200 are still being used today. So it's not difficult to fake something any really 
but it is easy to detect it if someone used a material that's anachronistic. So we, sometimes we luck into those kinds of discoveries, but it doesn't always work out that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to read the questions that have come yeah. to us because there are a flurry of them. And so I want to make sure we can get to Good. as many as possible. Um, so the first question was, can you tell us more about the mummy artists? Um, you touched on this a little and the, the workshops. Um, and then the second part of that question was, was there prestige associated with producing these mummy portraits? Those are such good questions. And I share them because we know literally almost nothing about it, um, about who was making them. We're so interested in um, trying to preserve the identity or at least the context of those that are depicted, but the people that made them are even a step further removed from us. Uh, unfortunately, through um, archaeological excavation, we've never come upon an artist studio the way they had in Pompeii, where you have little pots of paint, or you can see, you know, the tools and context. We don't have any of that. We have some ancient records describing the process, describing the tools that would have been used to apply the beeswax and um, but we, we haven't actually found any of those tools to find out if that was really what they were, these criteria, these sort of melting metal melting tools, almost like a spatula. So there's little dangling threads of evidence um, in, the, in the literature, but very, very little. And I think um, as far as the prestige, that's such an interesting idea, right? Was it considered yeah. to be a high prestige occupation? Yeah. Right. I have no idea. I have I don't no either. idea. We really yeah. know very little. Now, I should also say that I am not, neither an Egyptologist nor an ancient scholar. Right. I am a paintings conservator. So my specialty is very much materially based, not chronologically based, culturally based. So there are those that know more about it than I do. Yes. Um, yes. But I can't speak to that myself. Yes, no, nor can I. I'm not an expert in this area either, I should say. Um, but I think it's a it's a fascinating question to think about. And, and I might um, do some research after this and, and try yeah. to figure it out. Um, similarly, we got a question about the gray purpley tunic of the um, SCMA um, example. Uh, and she asks if it might be the tunic capula, the morning tunic we hear about in ancient Latin texts, which I have to admit I was not familiar with, but makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I um, love that idea. And I'm going to bring yeah. that to my colleagues because we do, yep. fortunate, very fortunately for me, we have both an Egyptologist on our team, yes. as well as, you know, Susanna Ebbinghaus is our ancient, is the um, ancient curator, a curator of our ancient collections. Yeah. These are the people I go to with the, these questions. That is a really great suggestion. Great. And I love that you've suggested that. Yep. I don't know. I think the other thing that's interesting, what I can speak to is that you'll notice the blotchiness of the tunic is so strange and the original color would have been this light purple and that still remains. And yes. you can see how the restoration that we saw in UV is actually quite obvious to the naked eye, that sort of blotchy blueness. I think whoever went in to add to all of those covered areas of loss. Yes. So whoever went in to add the, that paint, it must have matched at one time, but now it doesn't match anymore. It's faded or shifted in some way. So that is, it wouldn't normally, it wouldn't have looked blotchy enough yeah. to make that clear. But that yeah. idea of a morning tunic is beautiful. I Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and that's you. actually, yeah, I love what you said about the way that it um, would have looked versus how it looks today. I think one of the wonderful things about ancient art or kind of older art is that um, things do obviously deteriorate over time, um, but that actually might help us learn more about them. And so even though there's not a kind of pristine painted surface, it's it's actually more helpful in some ways that it's a little damaged so that we can learn um, a little more. get access. Here. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, to the detriment of the work of art, but yes. Um, there's a few questions about the um, idea of repatriation. Re repatriation. Mm -hmm. I, I will just touch on that before I hand it over to you as well, because you did talk about that. Um, the ethics, as you said, of excavation in the 19th century are very different than they are today. Um, and this particular work was purchased by the museum in 1939. Um, at that time, that was fully legal. Um, those laws are not uh, the same today. Anything after a certain date and time cannot be taken out of a country. Um, however, at the time um, that it was taken out, it was um, completely legitimate and approved by the by Egypt itself. And so um, right now we have no plans to repatriate it. Um, if those laws change, um, obviously we will comply in every way. But um, if you have more to say about that, please chime in. The only other thing I have to say about it, because it is a really, um, it's an interesting problem. I was just listening to um, Sanchita Balachandran, who's at the Johns Hopkins Museum, and who's this remarkable, uh, she's a conservator and also just a remarkable technical art historian. She's done a lot of work on mummies, preserved mummy bodies, as well as mummy portraits and other materials like this. Yep. Um, and she talked recently about how there are 
very few descendant communities to receive this material that the Egyptian government doesn't seem to want it all back. And so there's this really strange struggle now too, where all of these, um, these museums hold these collections that feel strange. There's really nowhere for them to go back to. I think a lot of what the scholarship is around with the appear, the, the appear group right now is an effort to wrestle with that problem that we have these things and we shouldn't simply hang them on the wall and leave it at that. Right. Um, that to acknowledge what they truly are is very important. And that's the least that we can do. Um, I don't know of any that are, have been repatriated. I think there was there was a craze in the 20s and 30s to collect these because when did they discover Tutankhamun's tomb was in the 24 or something like that. And yep. soon after that, there was an, an, an Egyptomania explosion. And so, right. so many of these portraits you'll see will have accession dates from those decades yep. um, before the Egyptian government um, was able yep. to shut it down. Yeah. Unfortunately. So it's just that, yeah, it's a, it's a sticky mess. It's yeah. A sticky mess. Yeah. No doubt. Exactly. Um, there's another question about other contemporary examples that are non funerary that use the same kind of ultra realistic, ultra realistic portraiture. And I will just point to um, what you already said, Kate, about Pompeii. There are a lot of examples mm -hmm. from Pompeii and from other Roman, um, and I say Roman, but the kind of Roman world um, at the time that are very similar in terms of kind of the life likeness. Um, but um, if you have any more to say about that, um, please. Well, in. just from what I've been learning from being part of this project is there's an interesting coincidence that happened in Egypt because of the, because they were buried, because they yes. are funerary and because of the conditions, the desert conditions, the arid conditions of those burial places, it's a preservative environment. So it's a funny moment because we have these portraits, they, they survive because of what they are and where they were, they are by no means the only kind of painting that was happening. Much Greek painting, that ancient Greek painting is widely discussed and, and, um, and honored, but it, does, it didn't survive. Right. So it's sort of a, that's what's so interesting about these having a Greek component too, because there's sort of these, this um, residue of an even more ancient um, painting practice yeah. that didn't survive simply because it was made with on wood and it didn't, you know, it, it rotted away. And it, not because it was buried in the ground, but just because of where, wherever it was. So this, we're, we're benefiting from a weird natural coincidence, which gives us a sense of this, that like that there's more Egyptian painting, Roman Egyptian painting than there was of any other kind. It's simply just what we have that came down to us through the millennia. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good thing to remember. Yeah. Um, so there's another question about who might have seen these portraits in antiquity. Um, mm -hmm. Were there viewings of the body for family or the public before burial? Um, what I've learned is that they were they were painted during the life of the person, which is maybe why they have such a lifelike quality to them. Um, but I actually don't don't think they would have been widely viewed. Um, but I you can so either. I think from what I've been able to learn from my um, Jen Thumb, who's a who's at the Harvard Art Museum. She's an Egyptologist, but she's also in our academic programs um, department. She, um, what she says is that these were made, the idea of preserving the body at all, mm -hmm. and the idea of, of preserving identity had to do with the afterlife. It had to do with being able to take your body with you and, and live and live a good life after death. And so this was, the, the audience here is not us. Right. Um, so, the, and the fact that they're, they're so, there's a, a generic, they're not generic portraits, they're certainly individualized, they're certainly of individuals, but there's a genericized quality, the fact that the Smith and Harvard examples can be so similar to each other, but clearly be made by different people, and be of different people, we start to wonder if there wasn't some sort of template or device or method that would have been repeatable, and then made individualized as they went. But yeah, I don't think these were meant, these were not meant to be seen, yeah. probably. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a related question that actually there's a, a theory that um, they were portrayed and hung on the wall as a kind of a memory, um, which is I know a Roman practice, and so that gets back to this kind of hybridity of you know using the mummification kind of from the Egypt. Uh, Egyptian tradition, but then the Roman tradition of kind of the worship of ancestors in the home. Um, and the question is, you know, is this something you can elaborate on? It um, uh, would have had an impact on the representation of the person um, and the fact that hanging them in the kind of the Western way in a museum setting um, isn't that different. 
um, in the end from kind of hanging them in the home as a memento mori. Interesting idea. I, I don't, I can't speak to that. I have heard um, both sides of that argument. I've heard that there are those that embrace that theory and those that don't accept it at all, that they would have hung during the lifetime or in the home. So I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But I think I'm really interested um, as museums grapple so much with the way we represent our collections and use them. And I'm interested in thinking about how we may change the way we dis display these things. I don't know what that would look like yet. Yeah. Um, we're sort of workshopping through that kind of an idea now. Yeah. Do we want to hang them the way we would hang a Copley portrait three galleries over? I don't know if that makes any sense. You know what I mean? Should we, should they be horizontal? I don't, right. I don't know. I don't right. know. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, but everything is kind of taken out of the context in the in the mm -hmm. museum space. So yeah, mm -hmm. um, let's see another question. Um, so were people depicted as they looked when they died, or did they have themselves depicted as they looked when they were young? So are these idealized or actually kind of you know realistic? Um, and if so, what would they use as a reference since they obviously didn't have photographs? <laughs> That's a great right. question. It's so interesting, and I think that again that speaks to this potential template template type of notion. I mean, you said you know there are portraits, there are portraits of children, yeah. there are portraits of of aged people with gray hair and wrinkles. Um, so it certainly seems that they're captured. It seems likely that they're captured at, at, at death. Mm -hmm. They might be death portraits for all we know, right. um, but they're certainly not idealized in terms of um, chronology. Yep. Um, yep. But that's gathering all of these together and assessing them as, you know, if we could have images and think, consider all at once, we have something like three or 400 in the database now, if we had all a thousand together, we could yeah. start to say like, how many of these are, and that's a thousand people that we happen to have preserved that happen to come down through, collect. you know, it doesn't, it's not statistically valid, right? but it could right. be interesting to think about how many people are depicted in, as aged and what was the life span of people then. And there's so many factors, I don't know, but I do, I, it seems to me that they are time of death um, portraits and yeah. the portraits of yeah. children are on children's bodies, that kind of thing, you know, right. of course mom. Yes, and, and I remember you speaking to me about one that actually has, um, I think it's a woman with white hair and she kind of wrinkles and she's elderly. And so that would speak mm -hmm. to the idea that they were painted um, perhaps at time of death. Um, there's one at the St. Louis Art Museum that we're really interested in right now because she's been, there's a, um, there's a scholar who's linked a number of portraits as potentially part of a workshop or related in, in terms of the visual evidence in some way. Mm -hmm. St. Louis is one, our Harvard Temporal one that I discussed is one. And there's seven or eight others. And the one at St. Louis is exactly like ours but with gray hair and wrinkles. I mean, like exactly like it. And so we're right now collaborating with St. Louis Conservation to have them examine their work so we can compare them from a technical standpoint. Are they exactly the same in the way they're manufactured? Yep. That would be further evidence that they're linked. So it, there's a lot of ways to come at this um, yeah. that yeah. we're in the middle of. Yeah. Um, let's see, I'll just get to a few more because I know we're running out of time, but um, you called attention to the painting of the lips that showed up in the Harvard example. Um, oh, what, what, I didn't what get did back to, to that. that. Yeah. All right. When I got to the part about here, well, I can tell you that when I got to the part about, and thank you for bringing that up because I didn't yeah. get back to my own thought. Yeah. X-ray fluorescence um, point analysis of pigments. I showed you that instrument with the painting flat and it's examining yes. it using X-radiation to record characteristic spectra yep. and it tells us what elements are. So on the Harvard portrait, it was all the very basic palette then. It was only what was available in nature, um, you know, except with the exception of Egyptian blue. And so we have iron ochres, gypsum, chalk, carbon black. That's pretty much it. Matter lake occasionally. Okay. But red lead, we found lead on the lips, oh, oh. Uh, which explains the density. But the color is red. And there was a, um, a version, there's a, a way of, uh, of, of burning and treating um, the, the mineral, the lead white to create a, a red color. So it seems that there's red lead specifically on the upper lip of that huh. portrait. Huh. It's the only place where anything other than the basic, basic palette was used. Now that's really interesting because often these portraits have gilding on the lips oh. or some other kind of special focus around the mouth. Mm -hmm. And there's something, and um, my, my Egyptologist colleague could speak to this more coherently than I can, but what she has talked to me about is this idea of the spirit or the life force entering or leaving by the mouth and that the mouth is given special reverence and often that's why the gilding of the lips so we wondered if maybe red lead was localized there for that reason it's a little bit more 
it's toxic. It's a little more expensive. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's not naturally occurring. It has to be produced uh, right. by human um, industry. So that was interesting that we found yeah. the red, but because the color is exactly like bottom, which is iron ochre. The color is oh. the same. It's just that it's been treated with this other material. So that was just, uh, again, everything we discover just opens up more questions for us, yeah. but it's certainly something to note and to then go to our colleagues and say, have you noticed red lead being specially used on the lips? You know, what could this mean and compare right. notes, so. Huh, and specifically on the upper lip, which is fascinating. Yeah, I don't know, yeah, that's, that's odd. That's really interesting. Um, we have another question about um, material and um, it was, is there no wax in the, um, tempera example. So I guess in the in the two tempera right. examples, the the two tempera examples do not contain these no. wax. So okay. the, typically, I mean, there are some examples. Um, there are those in the Appear Project who are focusing all of their energies on finding material and finding that. Excuse me. These sometimes beeswax is used alone. Sometimes it's used mixed with oils or other additives. But typically, they're sort of wax portraits. Okay. and tempera portraits and those are the two big columns and then there's some small variations that occur within them but they're, they're more or less distinct from each other okay um we had one of our very knowledgeable um attendees say that there's some fly excrement on some examples in the british museum and so that seems to fit the idea that they were exposed for mourning um by the family before yeah. burial um, right 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 and so uh yeah it's probably um you know suggestive that they were done at least you know close to death um right one of the example one of the other questions is um can you test the linen or wood that the painting is on to determine if any paintings are connected or from the same region and that's actually a question i also had about um i think these are all on wood if i'm not mistaken but the the availability of wood like the local um wood as opposed to kind of imported wood i know some wood has significance kind of spiritually like cypress and so you know is that another way that we can talk about dating but also absolutely. significance yeah absolutely we've so i didn't get into it only because we've been <laughs> we've prodded these things every little part but we so we've um identified the wood on all of the harvard examples great they're all some are on sycamore fig which is a local wood egypt being a very wood scarce region there um the use of local wood versus use of imported wood implies potentially implies economic uh choices being made right you know so the the other type of wood that's most typically used is linden or lime wood which would have been a european wood so it have, would have had and then again we're talking about the roman empire things things they have access to everything but it has to be brought there so how we don't know how significant it is if the portrait is on one or the other, but it's something we always try to identify. We there are those that do have carbon dated, you know, looking at the, the time frame of the wood. I mean, for example, I think there's an example of of a plank for a portrait being used on wood that was 700 years older than the style of the portrait on the surface, meaning they've reused it. Wood is so scarce that they've 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 scavenged wood from an, a much more ancient object perhaps another coffin or something they were reusing and then created a portrait on it. So that kind of carbon dating can, can help us. In fact, um, one, of our, one of our beeswax portraits, the one of the woman that I showed you with the, with the stepped shoulders is on a very thick plank okay. and it has the, the priming is kind of unusual. It has this protein layer on it that we didn't understand. So we did carbon date that wood, right. um, thinking maybe it was much older than the painting, but it turns out it wasn't. So it, oh. it's, everything's a little bit of a rabbit hole, but yeah. the wood ID is very important. Mm -hmm. And there's certain woods that you expect to see and the ones that go outside of that mm. are something to focus on and understand. Okay. Is, is there a sense that maybe this, the same type of wood has also a similar type of style of the painting or is that too? See, that's not yet, no, but <laughs> yeah. possibly, but so okay. all of these patterns are again, another reason why we're putting um, type of wood associated with type of binder or um, type, you know, if, is there a priming or is there not a priming? If there's right. a priming, is it white or gray or black? Is there an underdrawing used or right. not an underdrawing? Is right. the underdrawing made with a liquid medium or a dry medium? All of these things can contribute to patterns yeah. that we're still just beginning to tease yeah. apart. It's fascinating. Wow. Yeah. Um, I have a more personal question for you because you're a Smith alum and this hey. has been in our collection since 1939. So I wonder if you remember this painting when you were at Smith and uh, you know how much of the museum was kind of a part of your life there and, and yeah. a, a eventual professional formation. <laughs> oh, it certainly was. I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember this portrait at all. 
That's I don't, good. I mean, I just, and I was a lot, I was, I was an art history major, but also like a, a studio, not minor, but a studio concentrator. So I was there a lot, um, but I don't remember this painting. Okay. But I, but your I, earrings. I ones that I, what's that? I do your have, earrings. yeah, I don't know. If I, these earrings are from the, the Smith shop and they have her the Smith portrait on them. I could That's our mommy portrait. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, the ones I remember visiting time and again was the, the Sheeler train, the Kirchner. Yes. Um, it, you know, the, the, I don't remember the little girl in the swing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> They're all still on display. Yes. Yes. I just there are certain ones that I would always go and see, but unfortunately not this one. That would have yeah. been really cool if I had That's known her already, but yeah um i'll get back to our audience um yeah. so let's see any human fingerprints or on any of the paintings that you've detected not on ours um in fact i'm trying to remember if that's come up with any of the other we had a conference two years ago the first of what's going to be a regular conference of the people that are participating right i don't remember a fingerprint conversation happening although that's something that certainly happens happens a lot so that would be fun to get into as well yeah although of course we wouldn't have anyone to compare them to but i suppose you could true. if you could match them across different examples you know that that's true that's true yeah i love that i love that idea that would be great yeah um so there's a thank yous many thank yous um would this be a very difficult object to forge or is it pretty quickly evident with all of your scientific means I guess it depends on who's doing it, how they do it. I mean, the, um, you know, the one that I showed you with the zinc fluorescence is pretty obvious. Also, there's nails holding, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious. But I think, but we didn't know about the nails until we x-rayed it. If right. you look at the back, it looks strange, but it, it's covered with this putty. You couldn't really make it out. Um, you know, there are clever people out there that do this sort of thing. Um, and it's important to, to study the collections you're responsible for to be sure that what you're working with is what it is what they, you think it is yes um but things get missed yeah. you know unfortunately yeah if someone Hopefully. if someone knows enough about the ancient technique they could right. they could do it right but, right and hopefully you know that the appear project and projects like it help us to understand and so we can learn more about yeah. things like that and and right. That's right. That's recognize right. forgeries if they're out there yeah yeah um so I actually am just mindful of our time. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. And uh, just, I welcome um, anyone whose question I unfortunately didn't get to. There were a lot of them and we so appreciate all of your interest. Um, please let us know. You're welcome to email the museum. Um, Kate and I will do our best to kind of um, answer whatever we haven't been able to. But uh, again, just thank you so much, Kate, not only for your time today, but for helping us understand our portrait on a, a, you know such an intimate level we, we know so much more about it now than we did just a year ago. So um, we really appreciate it and your time. Um, and uh, we look forward to more collaborations, hopefully, in the future. Um, and yeah, so thank you. I will just pass it back to my colleague, Lauren. Lauren, are you there? There yeah, we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to thank everyone so much for attending the program. And thank you, Kate, and thank you, Danielle, for your wonderful discussion. Um, and I just wanted to also thank Tag Ermanson for her assistance behind the scenes. And we have a few programs scheduled for this summer. As um, on Thursday, July 22nd, is an open eyes program. And the next SMA Conversations part of the series will take place probably later in the fall. So please stay tuned for that. The information will be on our website and on social media or if you're on our email list. And I just wanted to, again to thank our fabulous members and donors who make programs like this possible. And if you are not a member, I encourage you, or if you have questions about membership, please feel free to contact us and contact me. And we hope you have a great day and we hope to see you soon.